Good morning. We're here in the City Council Chambers with J. Mal Green, the yes. candidate for mayor, 23 years old. <laughs> when I was 23, I was not running for mayor. Why are you running? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's time. It's time for a change. Um, we have some new progressive ideas that we think should be on the table. Um, I'm tired of seeing so many different politicians who don't come in our communities, that don't understand uh, problems around the city of Chicago, and just tout their record and tout their resumes and think that that makes them qualified. No, we need someone who is going to be a good listener, somebody who's going to have good character and judgment, and make the best decisions for all residents in the city of Chicago. Tell us about your relationship with Chance the Rapper, and do you have a chance to get his endorsement. <laughs> so uh, me and Chant uh, were in programs, youth programs together when we were young. Uh, I mean, probably 14 years old. Um, and he brought me into uh, the music scene at U Media, Harold Washington. Um, his father has been a mentor Ken of mine. Ken Bennett uh, has been a mentor of mine for several years. Ken actually partnered my company with the city when I was 18 years old. Um, so uh, me and that family, you know, we, we go back to when I was a young boy. Um, and. and we, we still see each other and talk to this day. So um, who knows what will happen in this race? Well, I mean, you, your friends, do you have yeah. a chance to get his endorsement? And what would it mean if you did? Well, you know, I've been in, in contact and working with his organization uh, for the past year. Uh, my organization, Matters the All-Stars and Social Works. Um, the head of, of Social Works uh, is, is a great friend of mine, too. Um, so, you know, I haven't explored the idea of Chance endorsing, yeah, Chance is doing a lot of different things and giving back and being vocal uh, as well as I am. And I think now I got to prove myself to make sure um, that he understands that I can run this city. And then I think, you know, he'll make the best decision. Now, you wanted his father to run, Ken Bennett. Ken Bennett, who used to work for Rahm Emanuel, director of public engagement, was the guy he threw out there to try to mend fences after the Laquan McDonald video was released. Tell us about that. Well. Uh, Kim Bennett is, um, he is amazing. Let me just say that out there, that he is one of the most smartest, uh, one of the most smartest men that I've ever knew, known in my life. Uh, he worked in the White House. I don't think his preferable job was to work for Rom, but um, he wanted to be closer to his family, and this was the job that was open here in the city of Chicago. Um, he was one who tried to mend those relationships after Laquan McDonald, stressed him out a ton um, until he decided to, to part ways with the administration. You told um, him so to get out. Yeah. And I Chance mean, told him to get out. <laughs> talk, talk about everybody, that. Everybody, I mean, I think everybody uh, wanted to push uh, Ken out of out of the office just because we knew the type of man that he was. You know, he's not uh, corrupt. Uh, Ken is not one um, who, uh, you know, had a part to play in the Laquan McDonald situation. Um, and it sucks to be the one that every that that it all falls on, especially being the the black um, you know uh, person right up under Rom. You're going to take the most heat because the communities know you. So. Um, I, I don't think he, he played a part, so we wanted him to, to, to get out. I think so you said get man. out, they're using you, what did you tell him? Well, you know, I was an activist, so, you know, I was, I was holding Ken accountable, but he was also like a father figure to me, so I couldn't hit him as much as I wanted to, but I told him, get out, you know, they're, they're using you, you're the, you're the token black man, and uh, Rahm Emanuel is just gonna, you know, uh, uh, keep on letting this stuff fall on you and not take responsibility uh, for it. So, I mean, he understood that. He had a lot of stress at that time. A lot Did of Chance calls. say the same thing to his dad? Yeah, I, I heard through the grapevine that, um, you know, Chance said those same things. Chance has, has um, been very vocal already about, you know, uh, his distaste with Rahm Emanuel. And um, he even did it in a song not too long ago and said that uh, Rahm needed uh, to resign. Or, uh, so, you know, I think he was saying the same things at the time. He also led the No Cop Academy uh, protest on yes. the floor of the council. What's your position on that? And yeah. if it's not, here. what do you what do you feel? So I was here. I don't think the timing is right for Police Academy. I think at all. With, at all. Uh, well, I'm not saying at all. But what I'm saying is right now, no. I think right can, now, no. Why? No, because we have a lot of other things to prioritize in the city. All right. We're shutting down schools. Now we're shutting down more schools in Inglewood and turning that into one. Um, we have shut down every mental health facility in minority communities. Um, we have not spurred economic development that can create jobs. So my thing is, when, once we invest uh, in a project, what's going to be our return on that investment? So now they say $95 million, but because of the gaps and 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 the funding, it's going to be end up being more, right? $195 million. What's our return on jobs? What's our return on? Um, well, but that, doesn't that community need? 
police. It needs economic development. It needs people to be in that community, to work there, to shop there, right? We need people in that community to have a grocery store to go to. We need people in that community to, to have a job that they can go into in that community that has benefits. I don't think this project right now will create jobs. You're talking about creating a handful of jobs. Um, and it's not uh, a guarantee that other businesses will be sustained with this project. We should be talking about another economic development project that can create jobs uh, and get a return on our investment. The U.S. Justice Department said the police department is poorly trained. It is. They need better training. Don't they need yeah. a better facility? Um, I think they need better training, yes. Uh, I don't think that's brick and mortar at this point. Um, I think that um, we need to establish w how we need to, to retrain our officers in regards to mental health. Uh, and I hope this consent decree, you know, uh, does some justice in the city of Chicago. And I, I work with Attorney Madigan on, um, you know, a lot of these different policies, uh, policy changes that she's looking to implement. So. I think we need to implement those in the consent decree. I think that we need to look at how we're going to retrain our officers, but I don't think that means that we need a whole new facility. At some point, I think we could talk about it, but we got some other projects that we need to talk about first. Are you happy with the consent decree, or does it need to be strengthened and changed in some kind of way? So, you know, ACLU and Black Lives Matter actually came together and they presented uh, a few more things that they think can strengthen uh, that consent decree that uh, I kind of agree with, okay? Uh, but I do think what they've done, uh, Attorney Madigan and and how they have put- uh, And Emmanuel, and, well, give him any credit at all? No, I don't give him any credit. Uh, I think, <laughs> I don't think that he wanted this to be, be going forth, but she came to me and she said, I want to make sure before I transition out that a judge is monitoring this and making sure that these policies are implemented under this administration, whether I'm here or not. And so I commend her for that. So we have different policies, for instance. One of them is uh, every time an officer, uh, we wanted officers to document every time they pull their weapon out. And so that's one of the policies um, that I agree with. Um, so there are, there are so many different policies that I do agree with Attorney Madigan. It could be strengthened, but sometimes, you know, with negotiations, because she has to negotiate with the city, um, we're not able to, to get the whole pond as we want it. We got to get a piece of the pond and keep working towards the rest of it. Aren't you worried, though, that the police will become even more gun shy, even more laid back, even no. less proactive? Well, I mean, we could talk about what we've seen this week, and uh, we've seen officers sleeping on the job, right? <laughs> well, but, and, and that's another story. That's another like, story. You said but, it was because they were working too much overtime that Emmanuel's yeah. approach of flooding the streets of the five districts with up to 600 weekend officers was the wrong approach, was a burnout thing. They yeah. say these two officers, these snoozing officers, in, in were not case. working overtime. One of them worked some overtime, uh, and the other one did A little bit, little nine bit. hours in yeah. two months, or a month and a half or whatever right. so you were wrong about that yep. so what did that picture say and what do you do about so what it that, that, that there was some negligence there uh, that uh, police officers should definitely uh, they not they shouldn't be sleeping on the job and both of them at the same time at that yeah what um, what is streets. that what is so, that do you think well, if not overtime burnout what is it well I don't know if it's overtime burnout um, but I do think that officers uh, can possibly be burned out um, in their work, okay? And they, they also possibly have other things on the side and families and maybe another job. So we got to make sure that we got police officers that are focused um, in the right uh, mental health state where they can actually fulfill uh, their duties uh, as police officers. So what I, what I say with, to those officers now that we know that it wasn't overtime, um, that, you know, they should be disciplined uh, a little bit, um, but they should definitely be, be talked about to uh, figure out what's the problem there, why they're both sleeping at 4 a.m. on a Saturday. Maybe when it's someone just overnight can, burnout. You know, the idea yeah. of the, the graveyard, graveyard shift, shift is, is a tough thing. Have you ever uh, worked it? I did. <laughs> did you I fall worked. asleep? Yes, I did. I, okay, I used to then. F fall asleep driving home. Um, and, well, great. And did like, you get into an accident? No, I didn't get into an accident, but I used to wake up like all of a sudden, like, okay, I need to turn on the music. I need to drink something. And all so, right. you know, the graveyard shift is, is a little hard. So, yeah. Okay. What is your plan? to stop the violence. Yeah. If not flooding the streets with police, then what? So our plan, and we're gonna be releasing a more extensive plan. Right here uh, is future. fine. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So I, I'll, I'll say some of the different things. So how I break it down is number one, it always starts in a home, 
right? And so um, when they come out of the home, they go into schools, they go into communities. So we as leadership fail them once they come out of the home. But we got to have programs to figure out how we can bridge that family structure in a home. So one of the things is we got a gas and a gas program with guardian accountability services and youth accountability services. And so basically what that says is that if a young person, say they vandalized city property, we would make them eligible for this program instead of giving them a record and say you got to do a few months of this mentoring program or you have to do a certain number of community service hours or clean up what you did. Now, once YAS is uh, triggered, GAS is triggered, Guardian Accountability Services, where we would dispatch someone from the, uh, from the city to see what's going on in the home, and we can recommend that they do a parenting class or recommend they do a certain number of community service hours with that kid if they got to do community service hours. Or if they're on drugs, we will work with DCFS and, and mandate them to go to rehab, or we will put that child in a better home. So that's one of the things. Then we got to start talking about building up our education system. We need schools in Inglewood to be just as good as schools in Ravenswood. So they they should be on a level playing field and that's going to take the right investment. We shouldn't have 40 kids a classroom, the lack of clinical staff members. We're failing when they go in that school. I was kicked out of nine schools. I could have went to the streets and did other things. Um, and we have we shouldn't have a school system that just You uh, were kicked, kicked out of out. how many? I was kicked out of nine schools. And Why? I went to 12. What, what did you do? I was a class clown. I wanted to lead the classroom uh, the wrong way. Uh, and so they found ways to, to put me out and expel me. Lots of CPS schools. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you the last CPS school you went to was Wendell Phillips, right? Yes. And then you were homeschooled the, the, the final year? The Why? final year. Why? Um, so I started a company at 15 years old in Wendell Phillips um, with my history teacher, Pete Retzels. And we both were in control of the youth program and in Wendell Phillips. We did peace marches where kids can um, um, uh, get service learning hours. And then at 16, I had partners in other states um, uh, that were doing the same thing. And we said, let's come together and do anti-bullying, anti-violence programs. So we expanded that, that company to 15 different states when I was 16. I was going to Atlanta doing 30 schools at one time, and I had to be there so much. How I did you become parents, class clown to that? Yeah, so it was How'd mentorship. It was mentorship. By I had mentors, uh, one with Mr. Rami, Kim Bennett uh, was another one. Um, who took the time with me and to talk to me and, and actually show me how I can channel my energy and talents on a positive way. So now, yeah. you have two children. Yes. You're not married. Tell us, yeah. you had a kid, you have a two and three year old, right? Yeah, one mm -hmm. would be three in a little bit, yeah. Okay. Did that change you? Was that a mistake uh, in terms of initially? Of course, you don't view yeah. it that way now, but no. tell us how it changed you. Well, I mean, I didn't plan to have kids, but it matured me to, uh, you know, who I am today. I don't think I would be running for mayor if I didn't have kids, um, because now my outlook on the community, even being an activist at the time when they were coming, um, now it changed, because now it's like, okay, I vowed that I would always leave this city. I vowed that I would raise my family somewhere else because I saw people being shot in front of me. I saw uh, poverty firsthand, and I didn't want my kids to go through it. Now I'm having kids, now I feel that I can change the communities, I have to make these communities better for them. So now it just gives me a whole new outlook on life and they, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them every time I get home at night in these long campaign days and I let them stay up a little early. Um, but they, they made me who I am today. Do they live with you? Yes. Okay. And are you going to marry their mother? <laughs> <laughs> um,